Hi, welcome to our webinar. My name is Kathleen Madsen. I'm the Director of Marketing for Kronos Group. Today we're going to talk about the GLTF 2.0 exporter in Blender, and we have Norbert Knopper who's going to present that to us. We will have time at the end of this presentation to answer any questions you might have. What we'd like for you to do is there is a questions tool within the GoToWebinar panel and go ahead and use that tool, enter your question. As Norbert is presenting, if he sees a question that fits in what he's talking about, he'll go ahead and answer those questions. Otherwise, we will get to all of those questions at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Norbert, and he will present for us. Um, Norbert, I'm having a problem unmuting you. I'm hoping you are able to. Okay, there we go, here we go. So welcome uh, to the ma webinar Mastering the Kronos Blender GLTF 2.0 Exporter. So mainly I'm speaking, but I have to say, or I want to say that also Thomas Crest, my business partner, we both did make this in presentation, but mainly I will talk and also will try to answer your questions. And as Thomas is the Blender expert, from our team, he will maybe here and there support me in answering your questions. Okay, mainly um, what are we going to talk about is like what is the Blender GITF E2 exporter and what not. So I will give you a short introduction what the exporter can do and also what you can do with the exporter. Then I give you like a short overview uh, how you install it, the Blender. Probably some of you guys already have looked at the documents which are available online, but we'll go a quick through. And then the main part will be like using the GLTF environment in Blender. There I will switch from the presentation to the Blender. So I will give you guys like real time, you know, how to set up a simple scene, set up materials, set up the PBR materials. Because I think this is probably the most interesting part, like maybe some of you guys never have experienced what's possible. And then it's like uh, how to use the exporter. It's like uh, you can, that we, the scene, what we will create it, we will have, uh, have a look at it in different viewers and engine. And as Kathleen announced uh, at the end, we will have enough time for questions and answers. And yeah, let's go ahead. So, so what's basically possible? It's like um, in the last, maybe probably you know, like uh, we as UX3D, we have implemented the Blender exporter. And regarding the last weeks, we received several like tickets, like this is possible. Why is it not possible? And it will give you like a short introduction why something is possible and not. So basically like the feature set of Blender and other GCC tools like Maya, 3D Studio Max, they have a much, much more feature sets than GLTF. And for a better understanding is, so what happens in the background during the export process? So, so basically if like, if you have images or animations, but only not in always, in, this, in, the, in, the, in any case, you can export the data one by one. So in this case, the exporter is fast and you're just basically dumping the, the, the content to the disk. And some, some features need to be converted because if you have, for example, uh, a flat shaded mesh, there uh, the exporter needs to convert it that it's converted to a GLTF format. So it's like it has duplicated, face it, it needs to duplicate uh, normals. So that's also happening in the background and it's also like some features have to be constructed. So for example, if you Blender are really familiar with Blender, it's possible to link material to objects. And basically this concept is not yet in, in GLTF. So, and then you need to make workarounds that this is possibly that you were, for example, duplicating primitives, etc., etc. And some features, and that's, that's just sometimes the case, it's not possible to be exported. There are a lot of modifiers and other features in Blender, they just make it impossible to export. But we do our best, like us, and also like the, the GLTF working group, that we get as mass, mo most exported as possible. So basically, if you are using the Blender exporter, there are like two uh, approaches how to use it. 
one ap approach is you have a, a scene like what you have now, you download it from you know Blender Nation or whatever, and you just want to export it as a GITF file. In general, it works like the geometry works, the animations works, but maybe what you recognize is that sometimes the materials do not look like as they should look like. And the, what the, the exporter tries in this case is it tries to export as much material parameters as possible. But because of the original materials, this is not always possible. The other possibility is there's a node group, maybe some of you guys know, included in the GLTF Blender exporter, that it's possible that you get a, what you see is what you get. We will have a, a closer look at this later on um, when we have a look on the, um, what's possible and not. Okay, it's like, uh, what do you need for uh, GLTF 2.0? You just go to the website. Uh, it's also possible that it runs with 2.7.8, but you know, like the Blender community, they from my perspective, they always use the latest version. So take, go to website, blender.org, download the latest version that's currently 2.79. And unfortunately, at this point of fact, you need to install the add-on. But luckily, we have uh, the feedback from the Blender community that the Blender exporter plus bug fixes, plus enhancements, plus principal shader, plus EV support, it will be integrated for 2.80. So that's really great. Okay, it's like, um, so how do you install? You go to repository, you, um, that's on GitHub, you go to Kronos Group, GL Blender Exporter, and you just clone or download um, the files. So if you're familiar with GitHub, that's maybe, uh, I think I don't need to go deeper into this. And as soon as you've done it, you get a bunch of files, you get like, you know, I need the pointer as it did bounce before. Ta -da. So basically you get a lot of um, files and the main is like the docs, here you find documents, like it's documentation for users, but also for developers. In the environments folder is, um, because GLGF 2.0 at this point of time has no point lights, you have only environment lighting and here's a sample environment light. Here's some um, MISC files. And that's very important, it's like the PBR node. It will help you to simulate PBR materials in um, Blender. So basically this is the old one, which works with 2.78. And this one, I will show you later on what's, how to um, use it. This is the one which is already using the principal shader. And this one, this is just experimental one because we are currently discussing how to use dynamic lights. So this is like just experimental, but this one is like the latest and official one. So this is important for simulating the materials. And I will go later there. And then there's IOSIN GLTF. This is actually an add-on which you need to link to your Blender and then you have the, the tools uh, and the, the, the menu entries to export the files. So let me switch off the laser pointer, otherwise I cannot switch to the next screen. Okay, so if you're familiar with Blender, and I hope you are, and it's like you, you open uh, the, the, um, the settings, you go to Blender user preferences, and the point is you have set here in the file settings. I can show you later how you do this. You look for GLTF and then it's like uh, you look for um, export as GLTF of zero and then it's like this and then it's like you click it here and then it's edit. Okay. I will show you later live in, in detail where you find all these settings. Okay. And then if you're um, have it successfully installed, you have two possibilities. You have either the possibilities to export a GLTF file, plus a binary file, plus P, uh, PNG files, which you will get a bunch of um, files. This is probably most common of most of us. The perfect thing is because you can look at the JSON files, you can look at the structure. And, but for like deployment, and maybe you want to send it around, GLB is much better. The point is, when you're using GLB, sometimes 
and especially with large textures, the, um, uh, the exporter takes quite a long time. The reason is that uh, this, the encoding of the PNG data happens with Python. We are already in discussion with the Blender community and we hope that in the future this will be like implemented natively. Okay, so so mainly it's like uh, or like what's really new and what's really exciting about the GH of zero is like the PBR. And the point is like you have two workflows. It's the metallic roughness one and the specular glossiness. As metallic roughness, the workflow is in core. I will go like into details with the metallic roughness one because the specular glossiness is first it's like an optional, and secondly the workflow is regarding on the Blender side it's the same. So. It's like, um, okay, there's some stuff missing. Is This is like how to link or append a material. Normally there's some text, I don't know why it's gone. So as I, let's, I do it verbally now. It's um, when you're, you know, I will, actually I will show you later live. It's like how you append the PBR materials to your scene. So it's like, um, you have a file, which is your original file. We will do that later live. And then you need these node groups to be able to have these GLTF2 PBR materials. I will show you later that live, that it's more clearer. Okay, what's also important is um, this, the, I will open it also later live, is that this group, which we will later add, it's it's already based on the principal shader. So with Blender 2.79, there's already um, like this, which is based on a Disney PBR, is like this principal shader, and it's already integrated into this node group. So for the developers of you or the guys who want to know uh, why is this a big node group, let me just explain this. Let's give me a pointer. So basically, it's like we will later add this metallic roughness material. It's like, if you're familiar with with with, um, with GLTF20, you see this name, it's like the base color where you can attach the, the base color texture. There's like the factor. Now actually, these parameters you see, you see exactly the same parameters in the GLTF specification. The reason for having this is that with this node group, it's possible to simulate as most as possible what's, what, what, what the, the PBR materials in GHF are supposed to do. So in, what's very important here, it's already the principal shader using, which is like already um, speeding up things and makes it more close to what you see is what you get. Okay, switch it off and let's go to the next one. So to compare like the different nodes, so as you see, is like these are the metallic roughened ones, it's the specular ones. From that point of view, it's exactly the same because it's the base materials, uh, parameters, and the above one is for the base color. Like these are the P typical PBR material settings for metallic roughness workflow, and this is for the specular glossiness workflow. Later on, I will show you live what's going on. Okay. So um, I already go at Hans because um, Thomas has prepared a little uh, 3D model, but I would, would first like to explain how you later um, apply these materials. So at this point of time, as you see like just uh, some messy textures, but they will make some sense later on. So basically it's about like you have like, uh, we will later use um, a base color texture with alpha channel. We have a normal mat and we have like occlusion roughness metallic. And the reason why we have, um, oops, the reason why we call it occlusion roughness metallic is um, because of the order. Because the red channel is the occlusion one, the green channel is for roughness, and the blue channel is for the metallic one. Okay, so now I will switch. Um, to the blender. So let me close this application for a second. And let's open Blender. <laughs> That's not possible. 
it's not opening up. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> this is like, I don't know. Wow. I think I have a problem. I think the, the application is not starting up because I'm sharing the screen. That ha did not happen. So let's go back. Um, how to show this? It's, um, give, give me one second. So, ah, here we go. It's there, I don't know. It's probably because it's, um, I don't know. Okay, it works. So, basically, what you have is now I will open a scene. I think it's, everything is just incredible slow, that's the point. Okay, so here we go. I think like the, the system what we use is slowing down. So basically this is the same scene what you have when you, you open a default scene, except that we here change from uh, uh, the Blender render to Cycles render because we simulate it. And like this little 3D model, this has Thomas created, and we have close a uh, later a closer look at it. And you know we have a typical uh, PBR material, you know, and if you render it, you know, it's it's looking like this, what you probably really know. And let's go back. So what you normally do, you know, you say, okay, now I want to use uh, the PBR materials from, uh, from, uh, uh, from the exporter. You, and the point is you need environment lighting and then you use, as a background light, you need the environment lighting and you need, um, a file. Okay. Okay, and what you normally get? You get this environment lighting, like this environment lighting is here. But normally if you would export it like this, it will be not recognized by the exporter because the diffuse per, uh, parameter does exactly uh, not exist. So what we want to do is like, we want to now add this material. And let's take, um, we need to link it. And I think every time when I open a link, everything slows down. Yeah. So this actually, what I explained is like, you know, the principal materials in the GLT metallic roughness, and you link it, and I'll go back, and here I have the material, and now what I normally do, you remove the diffuse one, and now there's a group called GLTF metallic roughness, and you can plug it in, and if you render it, it's already what you see is what you get. So normally if you would now um, export this one, you would exactly see it like this. So if, for example, if I here change the, the colors, these are like the real PBR materials. Okay, the point is because I lost some time because somehow it is all slowed down. So let me open the final file because otherwise I think this will take too long. 
So I will take this one. So this file is like the final one, and let me show you what I've done. So basically, is this is like the rendered one, and now you see like these are like the textures what you have seen before. So like it's like this is what you see is what you get. It's like and uh, you have environment lighting. We have some materials which are we create with Substance Painter, and now have a, let's have a low, closer look at the materials. So basically. You're taking an image texture and you plug it in to the base color. We have this ambient occlusion plus roughness and metallic. You plug it in here to metallic roughness and to the occlusion part. And here we have the normal map. What's very important is that here you look, it's like this is color data because the base color is color data. And here you say because it's uh, the metallic roughness information, it's non-color data. And also then uh, the, it's non-color data. Actually, the viewer here, takes this data into account, and also if you're implementing a, a viewer, etc., this information is, is used as well. So um, basically, it's like I have now this environment, and now what is possible, and I hope uh, this works fine, I now try to export this as a GLTF file. And normally, this doesn't take so long. I think it's just because of the presentation. And I will close Blender after this. So it's both possible you can export it as a GLB file or GLTF file. And yeah, let's export it here. And now I would like to show you like some settings. Here you can say set your um, copyright settings. You can say you want to have the normally your, uh, that any data is um, stored to disk, like you have a binary file and you have images and you can click if you want to have them embedded. Strip delimiters is for, you know, it's like um, uh, normally the JSON file is more human readable, but if you want to save some bytes, you can do this and it will be like a compact JSON file. Um, export selection is clear that only the selected elements are exported. Export all layers is, uh, you know, all elements on all layers. This is typically used when, you know, a typical Blender file is so organized that you have on some layers uh, elements which you don't should be visible. Export extras is a feature of GLTF is that um, you can have extra data, like your custom data. So you enable this and the custom data is exported. As I mentioned in the introduction of the uh, webinar is you can uh, apply modifiers. So in some cases, this is not uh, uh, enabled by default because if you apply modifiers, maybe some elements don't work. But in some cases, you need to apply the modifiers. So it's like more sophisticated um, elements. So if, for example, if you export something, it does not, the mesh does not animate the, the way or like elements are not duplicated the way, try this option and it will work. Maximum indices is, um, normally, um, the exporter is checking how much indices your um, vertex data has. And it is checking, like, um, if it can optimize. And here you can say, like, the maximum that it's, like, by, by default, it's uh, storing as integer. And um, if you say it's just short and you have integers, it will split your uh, meshes. So because this is a new feature with GLTF 1.0, integers was not possible. So basically, of course, if you store it like integer, like indices data will be larger. But, um, but if you're, you're always on the safe side that your geometry is not splitted. And here with this flag, you can say you always want to have integer. So if you don't want to have a mixture between bytes, shores, and integers, you can here force it that it's always, if possible, with this indices. Okay, with attributes, by default, the exporter is porting everything. You have texture coordinates, we have normals, we have tangents, colors. For any reason, maybe you don't want it, maybe you want to have it more uh, clean or it's for specific case. Here you can enable or disable if you want to have it. So also, you can export the materials, but in some cases, maybe you don't want to export them because you maybe want to have the raw mesh. By default, um, the cameras are exported. Maybe you're using the GL type more like, like a library. So and disable it if you don't want to have a camera. By default, this infinite perspective camera, as far as I know, it does not exist in uh, Blender. You have either orthogonal, 
uh, cameras or you have perspective cameras. But uh, in general, if you want to have tested out, if you enable this element, you will get an pers uh, infinite perspective camera. Here, like, you can say, uh, OK, I want to export the animations. You want to have export within the playback range, because the range uh, is like, these are like nifty crifty uh, parameters where you can tweak your animations. Because we got a lot of uh, feedback from 3GS, or like the people who are using, want to, like using Unity a lot, they want to have it in a specific format. So this is like, um, you know, you can move the animations forward and back. Try it out, and you will see it. And if you have further questions, I can give you more details on this later on. For sample animations, normally the, bl the, the Blender exporter tries to export as much as possible with uh, with the animations. The problem is, uh, Blender only supports um, for rotations quaternions, and it supports like you have to trace translations and scaling. But in most cases, sometimes it's not possible to export it one by one. For example, if you have an Euler rotation, either you do it manually, because if you would just export it, your, your animation would look wrong. And then it's maybe a good time when you say either you solve it manually, or like if your animation looks dumb, just enable this. What will happen? It will generate a lot of animation data, but it will, you know, it will sample like at every frame. Export skinning is um, uh, that you export skinning data, so joints. Big skinning constraints is sometimes in some cases. This is like probably some of you guys will never encounter, but if you're liking into deep Blender, sometimes you want to bake them or not. It really depends on your animations; it has an influence or not. The other thing is. You want to have morphing. You can have when you want to want to have export morphing. You want to export the morphing normals, or if they export morphing targets. So it's basically, if you want to have a GLTF file, you, you know, you just would press here you now export, and that's it. But you know, if you want to try out all the features which I've introduced you, uh, you can you, know, you can tweak the export because maybe you want to have things not enabled, etc. And but by default. I'll normally try the default setting, and if something's not working, maybe go to the forum, ask, hey, why is this and this? And us or somebody else will answer the question. At the bottom, you feel you find experimental ones. The experimental ones are more like, it's more like they're stable and they're working, but they are not finalized by the chronoscope. So you have currently lights for PPR, you have lights for common material, and you have, there will be an extension for common material like that you have the blind font. Uh, um, rendering and also you have uh, an extension for the materials displacement. But let's export this file. So you see this, and as you see, the export itself it's fast. The reason why it was a little bit slow is because um, uh, so let me have a look. Let's open another file. So I close Blender now because it's somehow slow. So what happened now, it's created this GLTF file. So you have this box, and you have all these textures. And yeah, let's have a look how this looks like in different engines and viewers. And let's close this, and let's take the Babylon JS. And what I will now do, I will drag and drop this GLTF file to Babylon. And here we go. This is actually, it is now slower as it usually because like my laptop is now at the limit. So this is like the one we, which we created in, um, in Blender. The point is, why does it look a little bit different? The reason is there's a different environment map. But basically you have the same material, you have the, the scratchy uh, metallic stuff, etc. And let me open another viewer. And uh, let's take the one from 3GS, from Don McCurdy. Maybe you know, so it's the same. Here it is, so, so it's more our orange tent, but as you see, you have all this metallic stuff, but that's the point because like how they interpret the data. And finally, and because that's our presentation, I also want to show it with our engine. Yeah, and here we go. 
So it's the, uh, like what you see here, it's, it's rendered with our engine. And actually, it's like it's what you see is what you get. It's like we have exported the GLTF file. Let's close this and let's put this away and let's go back to the presentation. It's here we go. So where we are is like this is what I already showed you, like the different elements and like regarding the engines is um, is this is currently the engine which are supporting so I showed you um, so I showed you just with the uh, 3GS this was the one from Don McCurdy I also showed you with Babylon JS but if you guys are using the Goddard engine or like in A-frame or CSIM like th these are the apps and engines who are su supporting it also Probably all you guys, you know, Sketchfab, you can download them. It's like, um, so you can uh, even upload already your GLTF to, um, um, to Sketchfab. Let's go on like this. Okay, this is so the screenshot because later you see it. It's like um, to maybe go in the detail. It's, and maybe I will open again the file again to maybe sh explain more things in details because I think we have quite some time left. So this is like the output in Babylon. This is in 3GS. And this is in our own engine. And let me just go back. And maybe maybe have already some questions in between because I want to open Blender again because we still have time. Okay, no questions. Okay, let's open this again. Let's take this box. And yeah, let's let's say we want to make an animation. And here we go. And let's say we want to make a simple animation which goes from frame zero until 60. So it goes from one second. And what's very important is you see here the framework and that's taken into account. So if I render at 60 frames, it will, this will all happen now in one second. So let's make it to two uh, seconds. And let's maybe just make a simple translation. It's like uh, I make here the location and here I make again the location and to go back so what we have now is like you have this animation so what's interesting is also a BCA curve so if you have a look at the graph editor, it's like this is really exported one by one. And what's also important is, uh, let's make this a little bit larger. So what's happening is, and that's you know, what you guys have to take care of, is if you export it like this, it will be optimal for the GLTF exporter. But as soon as you're changing here the values, which is like, it's okay and it's 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 legal. The point is the, the GLTF exporter has to sample it because um, in GLTF it's not possible to have sim, uh, single channels to be animated. So in this case it's working because like all elements are exported. So I can also enable here is what you see is what you get. So it's um, okay it does not have the um, Oh, I have deleted something which I should have not deleted. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I, I accidentally deleted the materials on the disk. So, so let's do it like this. Um, let's stop the animation. I go through the uh, uh, mode editor. And let's remove like the textures. 
and here we go. And let's maybe here make the uh, base color to red. And yeah, let's export this. Okay, let's export this. Okay, here we go. And now let's take this file. I open again, I close it. And let's open the Babylon sandbox. And let's take the file, move it over, and here we go. You have the point where it's like always like you know, it's not a nice animation, it's because my laptop is currently like at 100%. It's like this, uh, this webinar tool is like soaking like all CPU and GPU power somehow, but you know. But the point is, it's working, though so it's like taking all the materials, you have the PCA animations. So I show it you now. So basically like all features which are available in, GLT, uh, in GLTF, it's possible to be exported in uh, uh, with the Blender exporter. Let's close me this file and let's continue with this presentation. Okay, what else? So what else do you need? Files and documents you file on the uh, Blender exporter and uh, website you see documentations what I had today explained. You find details if you have any questions please raise any issues and um, yeah, and I hope we can answer it. Yeah, and I think we should start with the question and answer because otherwise uh, the blender will explode my notebook. So please go ahead. Norbert, did you see we have some questions? Um, let's see, first ask, can you showcase some examples of animation support? Uh, let, can I read it somewhere? Let me show, let me show. Yeah, let me, I'll look for that. Yeah, let me just read the questions to you. So again, if okay. you can, is there, are you able to showcase some examples of animation support or do you think that you already handled that? Okay, what I showed you is, um, is like a location animation and uh, like where we animated the cube regarding the animation for the location but um, if wanted I could show something rotation or let's see let me close this it's like let me and what's also important is there are a lot of sample files included with the Blender exporter. And let me open some of them. So basically each uh, animation, for each animation type, if it's morphing, if it's skinning, or if it's, there are, there are a lot of examples already there. Let's so open it. It's, there are like a lot of, scenes and these are like also a lot of test scenes and for example if I want to have a morph cube it's this is for an animation where I want to have like morphing a cube it's like they're really basic one that that people understand what's possible and if I, I can export it and I would drop down it to uh, the Babylon or to our engine it would just work so basically it's like uh, until now you, you work with the blender and when you export to GLTF normally like you would normally work with with uh, blender and then you just export and then you test if your export is working I hope this did answer the question ah now I see the questions there's a box okay yes. show now I see. but I think you segued nicely could you explain a little about your engine UX 3D versus Babylon and 3JS Okay, it's like Babylon and 3GS, they are web-based. 
Okay, it's like there for the web. In our engine, there it's Vulkan and it's C++ based. So our engine is mainly running on Android. It's running on Windows. It's running on Linux, embedded. And Babylon, it's mainly it's 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 designed for the web. It's for the web browser. So that's the main difference. But basically. Babylon, 3GS, Cesium, our engine, we all support U, uh, GLTF, and that's the nice thing, you know, if, if, you, if you're developing something for a customer, you, and the, suddenly the customer wants to switch from the web, maybe to a, uh, you know, a native application, like on Android, you know, you can use the same assets, and that's the big advantage of this ecosystem. But basically, it's like, uh, you know, our engine is C++, Vulkan, and Babylon 3GS, it's JavaScript, and it's WebGL web-based. Okay. okay, awesome. So let me look at the next question. Uh, which one should I answer next, Kathleen? Do you have an idea? Uh, entirely. Okay, here we go. Um, I've been using KHR Lite CMN a bit. Is that going to become an official extension? Um, that's currently under discussion. The reason why there's a light for common and therefore PBR is um, if you have a look at Unity at the latest version and you have a look at the latest Unreal Engine, normally you have for PBR lights, um, you have a radius for the influence. That's because you know you don't want to have an influence of the light until infinity, because normally when you have these PBR lights, uh, PBR materials, you use a light with the physical correct inverse square law. That's the approach we want to go, or which is under discussion, because like most engines support it. But the point is for common materials, like for Blin and Fong, people are used for, you know, what with all these parameters and tweaks which are required and useful uh, for common light, and that's the reason why it's currently under discussion to separate it. But there's not a final discussion yet done, so the point is maybe they are united again, or they are kept separately. The idea is that it's currently under experimental state, that like the working group can test like what the exporter is doing it. So at this point of time, time they are not an official extension, but as soon as it's our official, they are moved from the experimental section to the main section, and maybe it will be one Chronos light extension, or it will be two separate light extensions. Thanks. Um, that question was submitted by Hans Christian, and Hans, I believe that that probably answers your second question too, which was to, uh, asking what the difference was between the KHR lights, PBR, and Comet. So if, if you want more information about that, just submit another question. We have another question submitted by Dan. He says, I would be interested to see the file size comparison between the standard translation animation and a sample animation. The, 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 the file size? OK, let, let, me, let me do this. Um, let's open the box. I have it. Okay, now here I have the box, and let's export it. File, export, GLTF. Of course, it's larger because you're sampling per, um, per, uh, per frame, but um, I'm really sorry for this, but every time I, it's opening, somehow accessing the file system, it, it blocks. And I have first to delete this. So I export it. And here we go. So I move it over. So it is like, no, it's non sampled. So it's like 967.4 bytes. Okay? If you see it. And now let's export it again. So to say in advance, of course, this is not an optimal solution. But the point is, you, it's, it's a trade-off between, now, it's, uh, it cannot be done at, done at all this animation. 
I know, let's make this force sample animations. Here we go. Yeah, and now it's like 1144 bytes. Of course, in this case, there's no big difference. But of course, like if your animation goes for like 20 seconds and has a lot of uh, different animation, and of course, it can explode in regarding byte size. But, you know, if you are on the gaming side or you're, you need to take care that, the, that this size doesn't increase, it means you have to take care what animations you are doing. So, for example, if you take care that you're doing quaternion rotations and also animate them, you're taking location animations, you animate them, you're using scaling animations and you animate them, use only them plus um, always don't delete keyframes or like a channel, just keep it like it is and it will, and you don't need to sample the animations. So like for sampling the animation is always like a backup if you have like an existing animation and when you export it like, like it is now and it doesn't work. This basically has nothing to do with the Blender export, it has more something to do with that the Blender exporter cannot do Euler rotation animations because it's not defined. Hope this is answered the question. We have a new question. How does the exporter handle non-power of two textures? Now submitted by Will. Uh, this works. It works. This is like the, the, the Blender exporter is using the uh, internal saving of um, textures. There's maybe, for some devices, maybe you need the power of two textures, but then it's a manual process that you uh, change the texture, that you say, okay, I want to have power of two textures, then it's up to the designer who's changing the texture. On the other side, there's no option where, like, um, automatically the texture extended to uh, power of two um, texture. So this is a manual process to, to summarize it. Is there a way to export the environment maps used as well, or is that out of scope for GLTF? At this point of time, it's not possible, but it's under discussion that it's exported as well. The reason for this is for the environment map, because it's a floating point textures, it would include we need, an, because we need the floating point uh, textures, and that's currently not defined. And then we need a file format for that floating point texture. Will it be KTX, like from Kronos, which will be awesome because you have even MIP mapping. But on the other side, side you know, KTX is maybe not so widespread out. Then is it OpenXR, is it, this, is it this format, or is it HDR format? So basically it's more a tech, at a, to summarize it, it will come. There will be an extension to export the environment map. But there's currently no experimental uh, uh, implementation, but it will come 100%. There's a big request from uh, different companies because they want to have it, just because of the reason when they want to export a scene, they want to have it look exactly the same like they want to have designed it in Blender. And yes, for the future, it will, be, it will come, and it has to come. But the point, the, the, the main challenge is like, which file format will it be, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, are there any more questions? We don't have any questions submitted. Um, Norbert, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Uh, here uh, we have a question. We okay. have a question. Texture compression. Is it possible to do texture compression? So uh, basically, it's what's um, currently the, the texture uh, compression of uh, in in the exporter is um, if the PNG file is stored to disk, it's using the internal um, algorithm from Blender and it's compressed. But the point is that that's bad. If you embed it, it's not compressed, and that's a bad thing. But we know this, 
and it's also in discussion with the Blender community that when it comes officially into the uh, Blender that this will be also compressed. So the point is if you're embedding the images into the GLB file for example or in a GLTF file the your GLTF file will be larger than it has to be. That's a current uh, drawback of the exporter. But we are aware of this issue and because we are, you know, we are talking with the Blender guys, they will open up maybe an interface. I don't know how it basically will be implemented, but they will open up an interface that this can be natively compressed. That is also fast. For this compression, was it about this compression or was it like about this binomial texture compression? Uh, but I think it was more about the PNG compression, right? Uh, it was a texture, texture compression. He said BC slash ah, okay, 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 okay. slash then, Okay, then, then because the point is um, the, the window with the questions is incredibly small on my uh, screen and I cannot... Okay, the point is uh, at this point of time only PNG are exported because that's uh, defined any other compression formats. There will, like, there's a company called Binominal. They're defining uh, compression for which can also run on the GPU. It will be become core, or not core. It will be like an official extension for um, for GLTF. But I strongly recommend to contact these guys directly because they know more about the progress and the status of the texture compression. But basically, it's like, I mean. The, the export is not doing this, but for GLTF in general, um, basically you're linking to a texture file and uh, or like an image file. And if this is uh, compressed and your image can do it, it will work. But you just have to follow the, the, the specification if, if this is all okay what you're doing. But basically it's possible. And uh, if it's somehow not specified, it, it can be made possible by an extension. But the Blender exporter, it's currently only exporting as a PNG file, and it's. I thought it, you. The question was about like if the PNG file is compressed, but there's currently no option to make like um, you know all these compression formats. That's at the point with the exporter not possible. All right. Are there any other questions? Looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, Norbert, if there's anything else you'd like to say? Let me show. So, first, I would like to thank you to the Kronos Group who made this webinar possible. I would like to apologize a little bit that it was not so smooth as I expected, but somehow the Blender did not like this uh, go to webinar software. But I hope you did get a lot of information out of this. And it was a pleasure for me, for Thomas and I, to do this webinar. And I hope you get we get some feedback on the GLTF Blender exporter. I hope we get some feedback on GLTF specifications itself. I hope you guys have some you know interesting new ideas. Give them to the give them back to the community. And yeah, let's improve GLTF. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye now.